This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. When we're on... And today's guest, we've got actress Charlotte Kirk. How are you? I'm brilliant, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on, Charlotte. a Hollywood actress. <laughs> been in many films. Ocean's 8, is it? Ocean's 8, yes. You like your horror films. You've been in a few horror films. Mm-hmm. You're also well known for exporting a lot of that stuff in Hollywood, which we'll get into. But first and foremost, how are you? I'm really good. I'm in a really, really good place at the moment, actually. You're looking well. Thank you. Yeah, mm-hmm. I am. I am. Trying to work on me a little bit more than... Yeah, that's the main thing. Before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up and how it all began. Where it all, where it all started. A small time girl. <laughs> no. So yeah, I was born and raised in South East London, Bexley Heath. Um, I am the youngest. I have one brother, one sister and three half brothers from my dad's previous marriage. And um, I was diagnosed with autism and Asperger's growing up. So it wasn't, school wasn't easy for me. I really actually hated it. Um, But, sorry, that's my dog under the table, scratching the walls. not me. (laughs) Um, She's definitely special needs as well. (laughs) Um, And yeah, I, I just hated school, but I always had a love for the arts, acting, um, and I did acting in school. I took acting in acting classes. And then I asked my mum and dad if I could enrol in acting school at the weekends, which I did. And then after secondary school, I, I, I need, I need to go to university to, to, I need to do trauma. Uh, and then I went to Italia Conti in Kent at the weekends, the Miskin Theatre. And then when I was 19, oh, I just wanted to get the fuck out. I just wanted to get out. I just felt I was, I always knew I was different, like, but not in a, well, not in a good way. I mean, that's the silly thing to say, but that's how I felt back then. Like, I just wanted to, just, I felt like I was trapped. I was trapped in Kent in this, in this world. And I just wanted, I knew there was a big wide world out there and I wanted to get the hell out. Um, And when I was 19, I explored some uh, modeling agencies in London and some commercial modeling and it was just then I, I I just I just I just was networking as much as possible doing what I could do and just trying to break down that door but it's difficult you know I think especially in the UK if, if you hadn't if you back then I, I think so maybe I'm wrong but I personally think that it's still a very very tough industry to 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 break into even now then in the future it just is and someone said to me charlotte if you want to be an acting and you want to be an actress you want to do it for real go to the u.s i was like okay not here no go to the u.s that's where the opportunities are so when i was 19 without thinking twice i went to the u.s and the rest is history 
<laughs> See when you get diagnosed with autism, because that was relatively unknown then. It's only been recently when everybody seems to be getting diagnosed with ADHD, autism, mm -hmm. whether that's to do with vaccines and that, I don't know. But mm -hmm. how was it then? Did you understand it then? There's a lot more, everything's labels now, so everything's, mm -hmm. yeah. people kind of get it. But then, did you feel like an odd it one out? It was even worse though then, because I was labelled and I definitely the odd one out. It was absolutely horrendous. Um, I always had a... Um, a helper sit next to me in class which I hated it was just having this like cloud over me and like oh, why has she got someone looking after her is she, like, is she stupid she's the, oh it was just awful my mum and dad were thinking oh maybe she should go into like a, a special school and I didn't I went to a regular normal uh, school um, but I had help which which was just you know what kids are like they're horrible you bullied oh yes yes I was the stupid thick kid that wasn't going to go anywhere was just it didn't help that my previous name was Dyke. Whew, that I got bullied a lot for that. So the thick, stupid Dyke. Oh, it was just awful. That's why I um, adopted my mum's maiden name. <laughs> um, so um, yes, I, I think that was yeah, that was one of the reasons why I think I just I just didn't like my childhood much. Really, I guess to be quite honest. I mean, they were my mum and dad were, were were great and they were supportive, but. I wouldn't say I, I loved, you know, and that, maybe that's why I love acting so much. It was it's escapism, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think, because obviously speaking about it, I see you getting emotional. Is that, does it, do you try to block that out for so long where you, you kind of just don't want to touch on it, where you just want to run away and forget, no matter if it's in America? Yeah, I think it's a constant thing of running away. Running away. When do you face it, though? Have you ever faced that? No, I don't know. I don't know if I have ever faced it. Because being an actress, I know so many comedians and they're the best people in the world, but the they're darkest. so fucked up. They're so fucked up. The, yeah. the laughter and the jokes. It's so hard to maintain, to be funny all the time. Cause it's not a natural thing for a human to just be cracking jokes and giving all your energy away to make other people laugh at the dispense of your own fucking misery. So I understand. Mm -hmm. I, I've not had many actresses on, but I, I know the dark side of it as well because it's still an escape no matter what it is. And I always use that word. But you know yourself that was acting a big part of being somebody else from a very young age? Yes. For me, speaking, being myself is very difficult. Um, acting is part, it's just easy for me. I, I don't have to, it's, it's, a, it's a mask. So I, 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 I have the freedom. I feel like I have the freedom to explore and to be and do anything I want and not have to worry about being judged. Even though you are constantly being judged, I don't really care about that. As long as I know I did the best that I could do in the performance and I was as truthful like as I could be, that's all that matters to me. What makes a good actress? Being as truthful as possible, being truthful in that moment. And that's that's what I love about acting the most, uh, apart, apart from the escapism and, and, and all that. I think it's the freedom and being in the moment. Because it's, it's a great interview on um, Brando when he says about... <clears throat> actors being in the moment and he was interviewed once and the and he said to the person talking to him he said well you're acting now everyone's acting it's a persona this is for everyone is we're all actors and and it's right he said it to, to my acting coach susan batson who's absolutely incredible she says if we if if we don't act we would be crying all the time would be because we're, we're so we're such a vulnerable human beings and if we if we were just real for a second and didn't have this mask and this public persona and this this just all of this stuff covering what we really want it would be a mess <laughs> the world would be a mess so but that's why i guess people turn to drugs and alcohol and all this stuff because it's it's you lose your inhibition and you become real i guess in a yeah way. we lose our true identity from a young age especially when you look mm -hmm. at the stats of kids laughing i think it's like four or five hundred times a day kids smile or laugh by the time you're 18 it's less than 10 so something's knocking away from that childhood from that laughter from that just playing with absolutely nothing in your pocket we're just free mm -hmm. but then everything becomes controlled everything becomes heavy everything yeah. becomes dark and I, the world's a mess yeah i don't i've never came across anybody that's got it figured out and i think you've got it figured out because we no all one. talk a lot of shit me <laughs> you that's my job is just <laughs> the full-time bullshit and yeah. i try and be as honest as i can be but are you ever truly honest with yourself because life is so fucking hard i think you are if you are on substances that's really fucking bad isn't it to say that but i think it's true when i am drunk or you know whatever I am very fucking real. 
I say things that I would never, ever, ever say unless, you know, because you that guards down. Or when I'm acting. That, again, that's why I love acting, because I'm in the moment. I am not thinking of tomorrow, last week, uh, to whatever. I'm in this moment. And that's probably why you love what you do, because you're in this moment now, and it's fucking great. But if we're... If, if, just day-to-day -day stuff is, is it's everyone's always it's really hard for humans i think to to, to live in that moment just to be well, that's the power of now that's something i always promote but again when i do interviews you're switched on so you can't multitask it's just that that moment mm -hmm. after it, you're thinking did i do well how's it going to go who should i get next it's just blah, blah, blah. it's constant pressure how's my kids how's my mom everybody's just it's pressure especially for a man but I yeah, guess women of obviously feel the same. It's not just yeah. say men have it hard. Everybody fucking struggles. What was your first ever part? <laughs> oh gosh, um, <laughs> nothing meaty. A part actually going on set. Yeah, just, no, just Oof. like first like drama or whatever. What was the first time you went on stage or oh, okay. even in class? Wait, oh. Stage is different. I remember um, in Italia Conti going on stage and performing and singing and all that good stuff. That's that amazing. Of course, stage is very, very different to, 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 to film. But my first set experience was I was in LA and I got a job playing a corpse. <laughs> I played a dead body. Yes, that was pretty horrific, but again, just being on set was amazing. But before I went to the States, I was going to go to Paris, actually, and live in Paris. Right. Uh, I met a few modeling agencies out there and they said, and I thought, oh, maybe that's a way in through the door for acting. Like, I didn't know how to. Um, and um, so I met with this agency. They said, yes, come live in, live in Paris for a year. Um, cut your hair, do this, do that, live here. And I'm like, okay. I went to New York and then I was like, Paris, no, nah, fuck it. I have to, New York, that's, it has to be. That's what I really want. So... But I would say my first like proper, proper acting role was actually a comedy that I did with Stephen Baldwin. Uh, no Panic with a Hint of Hysteria. Um, that was a great movie. But, well, a great part anyway. And I'm proud of that movie as well. But it's just every, every, every onset experience is different. Every role is different. Every, you know, and I get asked this, oh, what's the difference between, you know, a big set and a, you know, indie film and a studio film? It's all the same all boils down to the same thing. You know, if, you're, if I'm acting alongside Sandra Bullock or another great actor who's not a big star, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. All the same. So what was? So you went to New York first? Yep. What was that feeling like stepping off the plane? Was it a sense of freedom or were you scared? I think it might be part of my autism, but I don't see fear as much. I, I don't see fear. Certain things, like me going to New York on my own, I got off the plane and I was like, oh, great okay I'm here and then literally as soon as I got off the plane I had to go to a casting uh, and I booked that job as well actually and um, I was shooting that week after in Cabo so I was like fuck I'm in New York and now I'm in Cabo and now I'm here and that's loving it loving it um, it's interesting though like looking back I just felt like I was just on this running machine just going 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 kind of like I am now but I'm trying to take a breath stop and enjoy it a little bit more now that's what I'm really trying to do because I what's the point right unless you're enjoying what you do so I'm really trying to do that at the moment but yeah 19 to you know a good 10 years in the states I was just on my own New York first for six months um I lived on 92nd Madison and I was hustling auditioning this and that and sh yeah moving shaking just just feeling New York um, and then a lot of the jobs a lot of auditions I were getting was in LA so I was there for six months and then I moved to LA so New York for me doesn't seem as dark I don't know I've never lived there but LA seems to be Poor. satanic fucking yeah. dark seedy just Poor. there's a different feeling from New York is New York a bit cleaner for auditions and it's not so much the casting couch it's not it's just the pick more for talent, or is it the same as LA? Mm, I think it's the same everywhere. Is Weinstein that... was there. I met Bob actually, in, in Bob Weinstein's brother in uh, New York. Who was who was he? One, uh, Harvey Weinstein's brother. Oh, how was he? Yeah. Um, eh. See there. Yeah. I'd be careful what I say. I don't want to be a defamation or anything. 
you know. Yeah, I don't fucking care. You can tell me. I'll say it. It's, uh, so when did you kind of, mm-hmm. when did you realise a young girl, probably naive, but amateur, autism as well, you could probably be manipulated to a certain degree where people just preyed on you, grooming, you know yourself mm-hmm. how the, the game operates, but when did you start seeing the kind of dark side of it that this ain't normal? Especially if somebody's given their whole life, moving away from their family to make it, and people are saying, listen, I can give you the golden keys, but you've got to do A, B and C. Like, when did you start seeing the dark side of acting? I don't think I did until quite a few years later, to be honest. Or I was in denial. Could be many things. I don't know if I was in denial or I knew, but I just covered it up. Or <sighs> Obviously now I know. Hindsight's a great thing and it's I'm absolutely disgusted and appalled by my experiences and what I've had to witness and gone through. I met actually Kevin Gersh. He's a um he runs autistic schools in America. He's autistic himself. I met him in New York and he said to me, From the moment I met you and saw you, I, I was worried about you. We're friends, he said, but I was worried about you because I could see, you know, the, f- the first thing he said to me, we were at a, we were at a party and he said I said, what do you do? And he's like, oh, I'm autistic. I run autistic schools. He's like, I'm like, I said, oh, I am. I'm autistic. And he was like, yeah, I can see that. Really, really lovely guy. And But he, I was so young and naive. And he was like, oh. he told me a while back, I was so worried about you because you were hungry, you're ambitious, you're going there with your eyes open. Well, not with your eyes open. That's the problem. You, th- I thought I was. How much is the, does the glitz and the glams and the cameras and the fame kind of block away what people have to go through, the young girl going there, being groomed, being abused, how much does they actually try and block it out because they've got that goal set that they want fame. Once they actually get fame, they realise it doesn't really mean fuck all anyway. It doesn't mean anything. I think every girl's different. Some girls don't care. Some girls don't care. Some girls would, will do what it takes. And... Were you like that at the start though? Every situation was different, right? So it's so hard because people people like to um, people like to, as you said, name tag you. Oh, okay. So this happened to Charlotte, or this is what I've read about Charlotte. So she's a she's a bruised fruit, and it's, or she's a victim, or she's a perpetrator. They like to label, and it's just so much more complicated than that. It's just not that simple. It's. Um, in general, in general, it's it's um, you know not if if you're a victim of sexual assault, for example, does that make you a victim, or does it make? But it that doesn't define you. You are not a victim. I'm not Charlotte, the victim. You know, and I think that's it's it's a difficult one to navigate. How is it though when you're sitting in a room with these powerful men who had budget and funds for hundreds of millions, who've then got that kind of green light to go okay you're getting a part they're not really picking you on the part they're picking you on the favours that you'll do for them how hard is that when people aren't getting picked in talent and then you see young male and female both who are doing things to try and I don't know it's just it's so hard to blame it's so hard to kind of speak but how is it when you're in a room with these powerful men do, do, they, do you feel overpowered or do you think see the bastard or you just or do you not even know then because when you look, you you look at the Weinstein stuff, they yeah, a lot of those pure knew. blatant stuff. It's absolutely blatant, and the people who mixed with the people who went come to with, my hotel room. You mean stuff like that? Yeah, come to my hotel room, like grabbing them in and saying like like weird. That's fucking dark shit. Do you know what I mean? It's not a case of listen. There's a part for you. Do this for me. They're grabbing. They're yeah. demanding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The CD, they're overpowering. It's the same as the Philip Schofield stuff. I believe yeah. he's groomed that young boy at 10. He's he's told him, he's been visiting him, he's been going to his drama mm-hmm. schools and mm-hmm. he's gave him a part on the show. That's grooming. That's yeah. someone in power. Mm-hmm. Grooming. No matter 100%. if you slept, waited at 16 and slept with him, it's still wrong because yeah. you're, that's a sense that you're using your power to groom a young, innocent boy. Yep. But then you've been there, Hollywood, there's a part, but they'll, they'll plant the seeds and then they'll wait and wait and then they'll pounce on it as if. Did see a lot of these big producers? Do, did it feel as if the youth? Does a lot of people feel as if that that people owe them something because they gave them a part? Oh yeah, a lot of them feel like that. The, 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 I think that just doesn't work though. I think your talent shines through. It's all about your talent. 
to a certain degree and who you know, but not the sexual side of, oh, I know that person, so I have to sleep with them. No, it doesn't work like that. Because a lot of these people, these powerful people, they say they want to help you, but they don't. They don't want you to succeed. Because if you succeed, you have a voice. If you have a voice, you out them or they're scared that you're going to tell the truth. They don't want that. They're sadists. They suppress you. They'll do the opposite. They'll say, oh, I'll help you. I'll do this and that. Mm -mm. They will not want to do that. They do not. They're, they're very, very, very bad people. There's a lot of awful, awful people in Hollywood. And I think, you know, when I came across a, quite a few, I, I met very, very powerful people in the industry and in the world. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of different feelings and emotions. First, it's, fuck, like, this is really, this is, this is a fucking really powerful person here. Like, wow. I mean, you're in awe of them for a second. And then they do something or physically or mentally and you think, fuck, what the fuck just happened here? This person is evil or this person just did this to me. What the fuck do I do? Or maybe it's my fault or, yeah, but then this is kind of, it's, it's, so fucking, it's just not ever straightforward. Or even your emotions inside, it's like, yeah, but this happened. But but then you try and sympathise with them. It goes into like maybe, um, not Stockholm Syndrome, but like you, you kind of feel like, but maybe it is my fault. Oh, but maybe. But then you go back for more and then you meet this person again and it's. Start blaming yourself. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. And these people definitely have no emotion. I read something the other day, like 50 or 60% of CEOs are all psychopaths. They have no emotions. They're, they're, they're just not. They can't. They're just everything is, they look at you like an object, a piece of meat. They're narcissists. They're sadists. They're, they have no emotions. Not even with their families, I think. Honestly, I don't think they do. I think they look at everyone like objects. Isn't that the definition of narcissism, I think? That's psychotic. Psychotic, but they are. But These you, are very yeah. powerful people. And you think, how did you get to this position? You fucked a lot of people on the way um, to get to the top. And they look at you and they go, okay, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll say this and I'll say that and I'll pretend I'll do this. But they don't even fucking do it anyway. It's not even like they're a half-decent person where I'll say, okay, yeah, maybe I manipulated her a bit and this and that, but I'm actually going to help her because she's a nice person. But then it's not even that. It's just I'm going to get what I want, then I'm going to do whatever I can to kick him to the curb. This is, a, this is a game to them. The higher up the ladder you go, the darker it is. It's a power game because a lot of these people, a lot of powerful people around the world, they have all the money. Hire an escort or, or have sex or, or, or pick up a girl in a bar or whatever. It's a power game. I think that's part of it. Look at me. I can give you everything. But deep down, I'm not going to give you anything. But I'll let you think that. And yeah, come in here and I'll groom you and this and that. And But then, but also maybe they live on the edge because after Me Too and all this, it still goes on. I know so many other people that have... have shit's happened to them after me too because they can't is it because they can't help themselves or is it because that these powerful people like to live on the edge you know a lot of them like to some some like to be in control some don't like to be in control maybe they think i mean i'm in control for a minute but it's kind of hot and sexy that i could get caught any minute and i could end, I, I could end up in prison who, who knows what goes on in these crazy people's heads but why the fuck would they still do it after the world right now yeah, After me too. Yeah, I've spoke to Dominatrix though, and you've got billionaires who dress up as kids and put fucking nappies on and just and they take weird that risk. stuff because... They can't help themselves. They cannot fucking help themselves. Because there's no meaning to money for them. Everything's a game. They want to hurt people. They want to break people down. They want to feel in control. That's why they yeah. go to Dominatrix. And that's, so they, the control gets took away from them and then they thrive on yeah. it. Mm -hmm. It's weird fucking shit. Yeah. Look at Epstein. Look at all the names that's on his list. It's all massive names. Presidents producers high profile names where's the, where's the fucking list everything's hidden because it, the people who control this world apparently listen I don't know I'm not I've not got concrete evidence I can only watch a few videos and then make my own assumption but I feel now the world's run by absolute lunatics and you look at the mm -hmm. the trans movement and it's just it's fucking scary the 
the stuff that they're trying to push on to kids they're, they're doing a naked cycle there through London grown men with their balls out kids walking past if you if that's you oh, want to do that with kids there then you're a sex case if the parents take the kids there they're sex cases there's a guy on TikTok he, he's got his son dressed as a girl and she's getting hormones and oh, at gosh. 8 and 9 that's child abuse for me yeah, that the is. trans movement it's just kind of mutilation and I think you make your own decisions at 18 not kids at 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yep. You're only a baby. They can't function. They can't understand life. And if you're promoting it in schools, then people will get that it's okay. It's not okay to be talking about mutilation, cutting off your dick, cutting off your tits. And they're talking about anal to kids at eight and nine. That's, that's just pedophilia. Unless, if you're not telling the parents what the shit that you're saying in school about transgender and being gay and, for me, you're grooming the kids. Yeah. For me, all the teachers... If I, if I work with Terry Mullins, who's a leading polygraph expert in the UK. Bring in polygraph experts for every teacher, for every football coach, for every club scout, for every priest, for anybody who work in these places of power that can abuse and manipulate kids. I've spoken to enough survivors now to understand the main places that they go for they work in schools they work as football coaches or surrounded by kids where they can manipulate them go through a polygraph expert are you sexually attracted to kids that's it get the result back 15 minutes and people say oh it's they, they can be tricked this and that i would rather somebody lose a job yeah than a kid being abused mm -hmm. because if they get the polygraphic result wrong i would rather somebody lose out in a job than take the risk and a kid get abused kids need more protection but the i think human trafficking is at the ultimate high is the ultimate money maker now it's took over drugs because they're kidnapping people and they're selling their organs their heart their liver their kidneys mm -hmm. and they're also selling them on for prostitutes and so much stuff for the human trafficking side of things yeah but rem human trafficking people this is very interesting people when they think of human trafficking they think of that a girl or a child getting abducted in a, in a foreign country and being shipped somewhere and that happens that is trafficking but also sex trafficking is you making someone have sex with your friend or your partner or this or that um and getting paid for it. So, you know, some would say, you know, out there that that's, that potentially happened to me. Um, I have to be careful what I can say at this point. And as you said, it happens in every single industry. It's not just Hollywood. Hollywood's bad. Hollywood just brings out the scum. There's something about LA, that energy. There's, it's just an awful, awful, awful town. There's great people, but there's awful people. But in every single industry, there's just perverts awful 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 you know like i've just i when i just you know when i do other things i have meetings and i look into other industries and i have meetings with people or whatever i can tell i can tell this person's a pervert i'm like yeah you've done some <laughs> fucked up shit and this is a complete different industry that i'm in because you can just tell and i'm curious what the percentages can you imagine what the percentages of weird sadist perverted people i think it's high i think majority of people are especially men are perverts i think porn has played a big part in that from kids watching it at 9 10 11 i think it plays a massive effect on the mindset i think guys can then see women as objects mm -hmm. every man will look at a woman's ass or a tits so there's no denying that people can say oh i want to look at her soul in her eyes we don't because it's a it's a natural thing for a man to craving sex i want sex with testosterone just like when mm -hmm. a woman goes through mm -hmm. having a period everybody's got different emotions different feelings yep. so i just think it's a natural instinct for a man so to be i've never came across a man that's been 100 percent. like i've never came across a woman that's been 100 percent either it works both ways as well women are just as bad as men i think one third of men are virgins i think the majority i think it's a higher percentage now that women cheat more than men so it's, a, it's the whole fucking world is kind of upside down and it's trying to find the balance and understand what it's all about social media plays a massive part of it yep. of what is social media as well where people are just constantly looking for gratification and likes it's all fake the whole, so everybody's fake. fucking lives are fake see when you were in LA then were you just going through the motions or were you, were you getting a name for yourself for the wrong reasons how was it how did when did it start everything start coming on top now, LA is a very small town like especially at the top everyone knows everyone the agencies the producers uh, the filmmakers and because I knew some of the most powerful people studio heads and this and that um, they all speak is that what they do like abuse girls rape girls give them a, a little part to kind of smother it so they don't yeah. speak out yes 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 I know a couple of producers 
they these people haven't done anything to me but uh, and i've heard through the great fine that's what they do they will fly girls in they they produce their own movies they fly them in give them like an extras role in the background and party and this and that and treat them like me and hey i'll give you a role in my movie we've got a big a-lister fun da 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 have fun let's do all this shit and um a lot of bad a lot of shit goes down what's the fine line though from inviting somebody to a party sleeping with them getting them apart and then never speaking to them what is the fine line of grooming abuse to kind of you know what i'm saying like how where's the fine line if the girl's voluntary going as well you, she's got to take some responsibility of as course, well and i don't course. want it out and, and stop any survivors coming forward but there's got to be what line is crossed if somebody's a big producer and says look got a party come over I can get you a film this and that, but if it's not no. forced and she agrees to have sex, then when is... If a guy says, if a guy says, um, I'll give you a role if you have sex with me, that is sexual harassment. Yeah, yeah, that 100%, is, yeah. That is, that is, that is abuse mm -hmm. of power and that is wrong on every level. And it's like kind of exchange for sex. I'll do this if you do that. Prostitution. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So, no. That, that, that is just even a, a no-go. And that never, ever happened to me. Ever. What is... This is different. If someone said... You know, a powerful man. Oh, I find you attractive, blah, blah, blah. You know, he, the girl knows she can help him. But a guy knows if the girl wants it, right? I think that's what it boils down to. It's chemistry. It's this, it's that. If they're, if they're actually together, look, there's lots of director, actors, actor, actors that are married and they work together. You know, I was engaged to a director um, up to recently. So it works. It's just, but you, ah, they know. You, you just know. The guy knows. The guy knows if you're into them. But a guy will push. If a guy pushes and he knows you're not quite into him, but he'll push because he's a, a he's powerful and he is who he is, that's wrong. There's that's, there's the line. The guy knows. And the guy shouldn't even have to say or insinuate about work. It should just be, this is us. It could even be the opposite. I can't help you, but I like you. Let's still, let's date. Go around the other way. What about men? Do a lot of men get abused and groomed as well, as much as the females? So I hear. So I hear. I don't I don't know any personally, but yeah, I've heard. Oh, I've heard a few stories. So how true is the casting couch then for people listening, suck my dick, I'll do this, and your part, the part is yours? How how legit is that? Are there genuine directors out there to say, everybody gets an audition and they just pick the best? Or how, how big a percentage is, do what you want and I'll give you the part? I I I it's really difficult because I'm on the other end now because I'm I'm producing I'm 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 choosing actors on their talent. <laughs> I audition them. I self they self tape and I go great. They're great for the role. I, I don't I don't know what the percentage is of studios, indie movies, TV shows that 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 do this. It happens. It's happened to me. <sighs> but the thing is, I think when it comes to. Um, the real roles, when they, you're casting the lead roles, that's legit. I think it's when it's the extras and the smaller roles, that's when it gets a little bit, you know, seedy. But then I've heard stories where some big actors have said, you know, they've taken a role, but you have to do this as well. But I, I don't know the percentage. I don't know the percentage. There must be a lot of Chinese whispers in it as well. Is mm -hmm. a lot of it true? Because like you say, it's a very small town. Everybody knows each other. Yeah. Did you know about Weinstein before it all came out? No. No way. No, I didn't. I didn't. I really, really didn't. But I know I, now. I know people that did. Um, but I know some producers now that are, you know, haven't been outed or anything, and they're still making movies, and they're absolute scum. Who was it when all the stuff came out? But Epstein. How is it when big things like that happen in Hollywood? Does it bring back a lot of emotions for yourself? Yeah. What was that movie that came out on? Um, is it Megan Kelly and? Oh, what was it? She said or something? Is it she said? Sure. That, 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 that brought back a lot of memories. This journalist trying to break a story on Epstein or Weinstein. And um, it's all kind of the same thing. The same protocol. They have the same lawyer. This, the, <laughs> it's, um, it's, a very, it's a couple of famous lawyers in the, in the LA that represent perpetrators. Bill Cosby, Weinstein, the, the oh, usual clearly. Epstein. Yeah. And... Um, there's a protocol. We'll silence them to an NDA so they can't speak. And then what we'll do is we'll throw a narrative out there. We'll call them an extortionist because that's the best defence, actually, because, 
what else can we say? Oh, they extorted us because we're so powerful and we have all this money. And then what we'll do, they can't say anything because they're bound by an NDA. And that's it. That's their protocol. That is their MO. We'll lock them down to an NDA so they can't speak. We'll spin our narrative out there. Very important we get our narrative out there first. And then they can't speak. And when, if maybe they do finally speak, it'll be too late. The wave would already been gone. Um, but there is a law out there. Um, 1001-1002, Senator Levy, it's a California law that says NDAs regarding sexual harassment is illegal. It's illegal. It's unconscionable. It should not be out there. And uh, I am currently the test case for that which is massive. And if I win this this case, which I should, um, the floodgates will open and every victim will be able to speak. In fact, in the Weinstein trial, the judge did that. The judge allowed, lifted all the NDAs off all the victims from Weinstein. Now, that's great, but that should happen for everyone, not just the Weinstein victims. Yeah, it should be happening worldwide, same as a yeah, kid. Of the Philip Schofield thing, they just carried on doing what he's doing if they didn't get caught. This is one of the things why the perpetrators do what they do, because they know they'll you'll sign an NDA, they'll pay you off, and that'll be into that, and then they'll move on to someone else, because they know that they're never going to get caught. I think Epstein had a bunch of NDAs as well. Um, so NDAs, you can't speak, but it's just you can't speak to your priest, you can't speak to your psychiatrist, you can't speak to your family, you can't speak to anyone, and if you do, you are in breach, and they will sue you for millions. That is an NDA. That's because of the Epstein stuff. He used to be a maths teacher. He used to work with kids. So anybody that's... I wouldn't. I don't want to tell everybody the same brush, but any male who wants to work with kids, no matter where it is, is you've got to question. And there's a lot of good people out there who genuinely do want to help kids and mm -hmm. want the best from. I get it. But when you hear all the stories, it comes from a lot. Yeah. majority is male who work with kids. And they target kids. I've had enough survivors where they say, don't just target the kids, they target the parents. So they see who their dad mm -hmm. is. Is he weak as well? Mm -hmm. Well, he's not going to do fuck all. So that's why fathers need to be out there and exercise and training. Mm -hmm. Don't need to look mean, but fucking handle yourself because yep. when the shit ever hits the fan, God forbid it doesn't. But if it ever did, you need to prepare yourself to kill these fuckers. And yep. I, I would die for my kids. I would kill for my kids. I would... I wouldn't miss a wink of fucking sleep if I had to kill someone who harmed my kids, if I had to do life in prison. Not a fucking do problem. It. But people are becoming weaker and soft and more fragile because these predators, they, they, they prey on the, the family members first, the mum, the dad, the weak links, and then they'll go to the kids and they're not smart enough to Manipulate. understand yeah, what the fuck's going on. But I believe I, I'd like to think I'm on the ball and understand feelings and emotions. And mm -hmm. I, I just look at something and I think, mm, this is off. Creepy bastard. You just yeah, know. You know, that, yeah, you know. But look at bite. Maxwell. Look at Julian Maxwell. Mm -hmm. It's not just the men. It's there. This gets me so angry. There's a lot of women, a lot of journalist women that have wrote about my story and said, oh, she's this, she's that. You think, fucking hell, man. You're meant to be a woman and you're bringing, you're pulling down another woman like this. Probably you're getting paid off by the men. Probably it's a small town and everyone's scared of, in, in LA, everyone's scared of losing their jobs. Who That's, runs LA? Is it a couple of families or is it a big corporation or is it it's just a, many people? It's a couple of corporations. Yeah, it's a, it's a couple of people. Um, yeah, sorry, I just thought of something that um, I don't know if you saw. It's like last week. Um, I don't know. Well, it was a few few weeks ago now, the head of NBC, the, mm. one of my, that area. Um, the boss, one of the people that I knew, his boss, he just got done for sexual harassment and that's the head of NBC. And then and then literally last week, someone else in NBC just got accused of sexual har harassing an intern. It's just, the, it's the culture there. It's it's just, it's you can just imagine them sitting around the board meeting like, yeah, so I did this to this girl. So what are we going to do? How, how are we going to, how are we going to, we're in this crisis meeting. How are we going to uh, sort? This? How are we going to get this out there in the press? How are we going to spin it? How are we going to make it, make it, make this victim look bad? What? Okay, let's look at her Facebook. Let's look. Oh, look, there's a picture of her where she's not wearing a bra. Okay, let's blame her for that. Let's let's. That's what they do. Oh, buddy, fuck! I did this this girl last week. What can I do? Oh, don't worry, bro. I've got your back. It's just okay. We'll we'll just we'll just cover it up with this this way. That's yeah. the way it is. I had a woman, and they all know. Yeah, a woman on is it? Su I forget her second name. Susie. She exposed. Rolf Harris, but she was only a young girl in her 20s, I think 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even probably recently, where 
girls used to get groped. People used to grab them when it was accepted. She was getting groped with fucking Rolf Harris and the men were just standing there. Just because, ah, it's raw. Because they don't want to speak out as well because they lose their jobs. It's fucking nuts. Do the manly thing. Do the manly thing. Yeah, yeah. Put something in the fucking place. Be willing to lose your job because yep. life is no. life. That could be your daughter. And you've got to see the world and, and it's not just a case and there's no such thing as a celebrity or anybody in power. They're just human. It doesn't exactly. give them the right to abuse. It doesn't give them the right to groom. But they can be, to get to the high ends of that spe- kind of spectrum at the top, you've kind of got to be ruthless. You've got to be smart in a way where everybody is manipulated by you. Yeah. I've never met a man. We're saying that Alfie Best thinks I'm a good man. He's a billionaire and he's doing really well. He does a lot for charity and he seems a real good guy. But any other billionaire, you kind of think, mm, weird bastard. No, no, no. They've got a... And a lot of them aren't happy. A lot of them are not happy. It's half them to have a life because they're constantly, it's half them to even leave the house because, you know, they, they're they very powerful and they could even have fucking hits on them. You have to be so careful and their their life is very, you know, guarded and who everyone wants something from them. Um, who are your real friends? Well, it's just, I just think it'll be an awful life to be a, to be a billionaire. I think it'd be really tough. What was your first big role? My first big, big role is the role that I created myself so um when all this shit happened in hollywood i thought to myself okay i've been in la for 10 years now i've been around very powerful clever minds i know how the system works i know how to how to make movies i know how it works i know what sells i've adopted a very American commercial mentality. The, the film business in, in the UK is slightly different, I think. It's lots great artsy and dramas and comedies, and that's great. But for me, I, I'm I'm very much for, I want to make the movies that are going to make the most money, then they'll be the most commercial, and the most people are going to see them. That's, that's what I want to, that's what I want to do. So I said, fuck LA, goodbye LA. I've got my contacts. I've got some great people out there that I know and that I'm going to do business with. Um, and I'm going to come back to Europe and make my own movies. And that's what I'm doing. So my first movie was The Reckoning that I co-wrote, produced and starred in. I won 13 awards for that movie. Uh, it was about a, a girl that was falsely accused of being a witch in um, back in the day. It was, it was a horror drama. <laughs> um, so that, that was like my first big role. And then after that... I did the lair that came. That's actually coming out on Blu-ray in a couple of weeks. Um, but but the reckoning came out. I was on Amazon. It did it did very well. It came out during COVID, but it, it went to cinemas. It still did did pretty good. Um, and then we did the lair after that. I, I kind of worked with the same team, same production company, same director um, up till now. Um, we did the lair, which is like a sci-fi sci-fi action movie. That's also on Amazon. Um, and it's nice to get genuine movie fans that just like people that follow me and go, I love what you do. Like they don't even know about the, this shit in Hollywood. They're like, I, lo- I saw you in that role and I love it. And it's like, oh, that's so cool. Like, that's what, that's why I do what I, what I do. Cause I just, you know, you get people that love it and love your films and you want to entertain people. Um, and then the two movies coming out this year that I am oh, the most excited for yet. So The Reckoning and The Lair Horror. The the layers are sci fi horror. The reckonings are pretty much mm-hmm. horror drama. Um, Duchess is a, a gangster movie, British gangster movie that's coming out this year. It went to Cannes, and um, well, it's coming out now. And Compulsion is an erotic thriller. So, but a mixture there, isn't it? Huh? It's a mixture there. <laughs> Fucking gangsters, erotic horror. Look, <sighs> what can I tell you? It sells. Action, horror, sci fi. It's, it's yeah what's the rumours about the Bond girl because obviously it was all over the news and stuff mm-hmm. potentially got a part in Bond can you speak on that not yet <laughs> soon 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 but yeah no I, I'm really excited there's lots of lots of exciting things like like now I'm yeah I've been back here for like two years but it's not like I'm back here like a part of me was like oh my god I'm moving back to the UK it's horrible I'm going back to to you know um but it, it's not i was like no i'm not going back defeated i'm going back stronger i'm going back with a career i'm going back making films i'm going back with my family and friends and and i can always still go back to the us so and that's what i'm doing so 
you know, a lot of things, are, lots of films, TV shows are filming in Europe now because of the tax credit. Not many things, nothing really shoots in LA anymore. They're filming Batman in Scotland, Glasgow. Yeah. I just came back from Malta. They're filming Gladiator in Malta. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, so it's like all the, all the, bad stuff that happened to me in LA, the good, the bad, whatever. It's kind of, I feel like I've come full circle and I've come, okay, I'm back here now and I'm... Cool, stronger. Yeah. So even all the dark stuff, when did you open your eyes to it? You thought, fuck, that something ain't right here. Did you always have, did you always know, but then when was the moment you, you decided to make a stand? Hmm. Was it a certain moment or something happened where it triggered you and done? Yeah, when when I heard certain people were bad mouthing me, when I heard that they were talking shit about me and saying don't hire her, don't do this, don't do that, that was it. I was like, no, absolutely not. There's only there's only so much I can take. No, when you're when you're making shit up about me and because you don't want because I was kind of getting momentum and getting work on my own and they didn't like that and they wanted to stop that. When I found that out, I was like, no, that's it, no. So if you don't dance to their tune, that's when you get blackballed? Yeah. Were you feeling that then? Yeah, but it's almost like you're doomed from the start. Because but do they then say, well, I made you? And it's a case of you do as I say still as well, where they've not got that full control? Yeah, I think part of it is that. and But but it's just better not even to meet them because people think, oh, yeah, but the contacts, the, the opportunities. No, because because if you if you do well, they'll try and stop you. They're not going to help you, so there's not a win situation here. It's a lose lose for you. There's there's no good outcome. It's all bad. See, before you spoke out, did you know that they would come for you? Where you would be defamed? They would throw mud. Did you know this? Were you ever given a heads up, or did you do it all yourself? No, I I I. Well, when the story hit, um, I didn't have control over that because someone sold my story. That was not me. Uh, if that was me, I certainly wouldn't paint myself the way that I was painted in the press. Um, someone said to me, a journalist said to me, Charlotte, I think if your story didn't come out, if I didn't write about your story, I don't think you'd be here today. So who knows if that's true. But in a Killed off? Hmm. Does that happen over there? People go missing. Who the fuck knows? They just go. I mean, so many people go missing in the US. Oh, so many. It's easy done there, though. Yeah. So, see when the story broke, how much pressure then was on it? When it because your name's at the forefront of exposing a lot of big, big shit over there. How much pressure came onto your life? Did you think your career was over as well? Because obviously these people run. Yeah. The film industry. Yeah. Well, I felt like I had a lot more to prove. It was kind of a relief. Like, oh, fuck, okay, it's a relief, it's out there, I don't have to worry. And But at the same time, it's like, no, because it's not the truth and it's not out there and I can't speak about it. And I've got this kind of cloud over my name. I can't, I'm not proud. I wasn't proud to say I'm Charlotte Kirk. And that's so, so fucking important. And, and, it's, and it's converting that. Okay, I'm in the public eye now, but it's, it's like, oh, but it's not a good thing because I need to convert mm-hmm. this 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 mystique, this this black widow. It's yeah, because people me. will be watching, thinking, "Tell me, tell me." But you've still got a gag in order. Is that correct? Is that the same as an NDA? What's this, what's yeah. the difference? When can you ever get closure with it? Do you feel as if you're always trying to prove yourself? Yes, but I think that to me is a natural anyway. Like. It's like when I first got there, I was like, okay, I, I, I'm just going to like, I just want to do a star in a movie and, and show my talent and, and, and enjoy what I do and love what I do. And then I'd done that and I was like, yeah, well, that's not enough. Now I want to do this. And then I did that and then that's not enough. And it's kind of like, and I feel like I have a lot more to prove because of that. Um you know, like some some of the critics that watch my movies are a bit like, I think, yeah, they they, they compare, they're writing it and they're writing about the shit that happened in the press. It's like, right, are you right? Should you not just be focusing on the movie and the role and the character? So that's influenced quite a bit. So that's but but when it comes down to work acting, I'm just like I, I just try and block out the noise and the bullshit and just focus on what's what's important. Can you still go back to LA? Or is your life in danger? Oh no 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 I. I I'll go back. I've been back, and I, and I need to go back this month. Um, Do you not feel uneasy there? 
I went back a short while ago and I have to tell you the energy there. <gasps> Since COVID, a lot of people have moved out. I think a lot of people in the entertainment business, like actors, and we don't. I don't need to be there. If I need an audition for something, actor, I'll just self-tape or this. I don't need to be there. I think a lot of actors have just, and it's true, um, a lot of homeless people, so many homeless people since COVID even more so, literally just rows of them. It's so sad. And they're, and they're just the energy there, man. I was just like in the bank one day and I was just queuing up and this woman looked at me and started, why are you so close to me? Oh, like every, I'm like, whoa, I'm so like, everyone is just like, it's got this anger, this energy about them. And I've never, ever been in a, in a city like that before. It's just bad. It's I'm starting to feel the same in London. Really? Yeah. I used to love it here, but it just seems to be a little shift somewhere where the energy just seems a bit heavy. I don't know what oh, that is. Try going to LA. You been to LA? Yeah, I used to stay in LA about years ago. Oh, if you go back now. I was going to do motivational speaking over in America. Huh? I was going to do motivational speaking there. They fucking, fucking love it there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The opportunities are class there. And, I'm, and there must be good people Massive. who want to help. Because the Americans are fucking nuts, but they're quite, a lot of them are friendly. Every American I've ever came across are friendly. They're always interested, yep. genuinely, of mm -hmm. what you do. There's no, there's, it's not, true. there's not much darkness against the average person who, yep. who genuinely wants to help you. There's so many like uh, book offers there and guests and they can't wait to see me and they're buzzing and yeah. I can help with this book and I can help you push this in America. Like people, maybe like, maybe there is a fucking dark side behind it, manipulate. I don't know, I've never met them, but everybody I've interacted with over social media or the telephone, they all seem 100% where they, I feel as if more welcome there sometimes than I would in the UK. And they're happy for you there when you yeah, succeed. Yeah, why is that? It's, I think it's like the British mentality is, is kind of like if you do well, it's like, I don't know if it's like a jealousy or resentment, like, a, oh, okay. Or like everyone in, a lot of people in the US drive drives nice cars. It's like, if you drive a nice car here, it gets stolen or scratched. Mm. It's like, it's just, it's just the mentality here. Maybe it's the suppression here and the, the class. Do you feel like there's a class system still here? Yeah, it always will be. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter how successful you are, you're still from where you are and I'm still from where I am. That's always, the problem. Yeah, you never forget yourself and I think people always get humbled eventually no matter how big they become. See, when you, what was Sandra, who was, what was Sandra Bullock like? Lovely. She looks fucking amazing for her, is she in her 50s, 60s yeah. now? She's in her mid 50s, mm. looks amazing. Very lovely, very empathetic. Um, but but I've, I've made, I've made him like, I met Al Pacino a number of times. Who was he? <sighs> Lovely, like the the the. I, I feel like we, and Emma Thompson and all these all these brilliant actors. I think they all have a they they make they they're very they have this aura about them. They're always, as I said earlier, they're always in the moment. That's amazing. Like even when they're not acting and they and they're not they're with you. They're talking to you. No, there's no noise. There's no. When I was talking to Emma Thompson. There were so many people trying to talk to her. She was just focused on me. That was it. As if I was the only person that existed, and it was amazing. And she, and she, I told her about my story and this and that, and she knew, and she was just so, she had so much empathy towards me. And I was just like, wow, it's just like, that's what, I think that's what makes some of these actors so brilliant, their their level of empathy. Who is your favourite actor? <sighs> oh, I have a few. I mean, Pacino, for sure. Um, Meryl Streep, Susan Sarandon. Loving Brian Cranston at the moment. I'm starting to watch Breaking Bad. I know I'm very late to the party. Have I've you seen it? I've never oh, seen it. God, it's brilliant. I don't like to jump on a bandwagon when people talk about everything. Yeah, but it's old. It's old. It's old. Yeah. It's old. Yeah, I've never like... seen it, surprisingly. I've never <laughs> seen... Um, what was the one that or the back in the day they used to wear the old hats and that? that like gangs? Oh, oh, Peaky Blinders? Peaky Blinders. No. No, I, I, I started... I started watching that in Game of Thrones. I, say, I tend to watch, if I'm going to watch a movie, I'll tend to watch the same fucking one I've been watching for the last 30 years. There's always about 10 or 20 I go back to. The same ones, yeah, yeah. a bit like me. You have the same movies on your laptop and you just yeah, repeat. same shit. And I yeah. think, why the fuck am I watching this again? American Horror Story. Hmm. Have you seen that? Yeah. Oh, it's brilliant. Do That's you like cool. horrors? Yes. They're fun to make as well. They're very, very fun. What's the, yeah, what's the funnest, best genres to make? Horrors. Horrors. How so? Just makeup and <laughs> just fun, fun guts. And horror, horror, you know, directors, actors, they're fun. 
it's lots of blood and there's action and it's like okay so how how are we gonna kill this person today and how are we gonna chop his head off and this and that? it's fun it's not it's not it's not dark doing dramas is dark because you've got to be in there and you've got to be in the moment and you've got to be be there you know, that's tough that's that's tougher for me um act, uh, horrors are very very similar to comedies what makes a good director <sighs> visionary they've got a it's, it's lots of elements it's knowing how to work with actors getting the performance out of the actors i like guy ritchie films the gentleman was class. Hugh Grant was fucking unbelievable. So you that. are going, yeah, you are going to like Duchess. Duchess yeah. is, I, so I came up with the, me and Neil Marshall came up with the idea of Duchess. We we're sitting there one day and I was like, oh, fuck. All the great fucking gangster movies, Goodfellas, Scarface, Layer Cake. Layer Cake. When's the last good gangster film? Yeah, maybe The Gentleman. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, what else? Yeah, they fell it through their ass. The American ones seem to be better. The British ones, mm. their cake, their cakes up there. Lockstock, I like Guy Ritchie's films are unbelievable. Yeah, his, and his mindset's different. Yeah, brilliant. How can you? It's just producing these certain things. Just how it all interacts to our stories is beyond how that method of thinking. Do you know what helps? Genius voiceover. Mm -hmm. I fucking love voiceover. You when that character talks over the mm -hmm. yeah yeah. Um, so yeah, and I was just like, oh, oh, when's the last? There wasn't. There wasn't a, a, a very good gangster movie in a long time. So I was like, what if one of the best movies ever, Scarface? Imagine if it was like a, we could do a Scarface. What if we could do a, a female Scarface? And that's where Duchess was born. When's it out? Uh, we took it to Cannes. We have a few offers at the table now. Offers, so we're just just gonna accept one in the next few weeks and get it out there. So how does that work then? When you produce a film or direct a film, you've got to. How does it work? Starting from funding, you've got to get funding. You've got to make it. Script. Get actors, script. So script first and foremost. Number one script. Come up with the idea and the script. Uh, and by the way, in Duchess, you Stephanie Beecham, legendary mm -hmm. actress. She's in that. Philip Winchester, Sean Pertwee, Cole Meaney, Cole Meaney, who was in Layer Cake. He played my dad. Fucking phenomenal. I was so fucking scared. Uh, this, the day when I, he had to come in and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And he was just... How long did it take to make? We shot it in Tenerife. We were there for two months. The business was a good gangster film. Business was good, yes. Uh, Tama, sexy Hussein. Beast. Sexy Beast. Yeah, is that um, like, um, big English yeah. actor, big fucking... I forget his Ben name. Knightley? No. The kid who's doing like, who's the kid that's playing like Freddie Mercury and stuff? He's, he's <sighs> classy now. Brilliant. Unbelievable film that. Brilliant. That was, a, I watched that movie oh, the, the boy other day. Elton John as well, he played. Yeah. He's. He was great as well. He does like a spy film as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. It's not the gentleman, but some. Kingsman. Kingsman. That was There's very There's a good. lot of good, like, um, who's the, the, the guy who played the craze? Oh, that was ages ago, that movie, Yeah, right? who the fuck? Tom Hardy. I love his films, man. What an actor. Brilliant. Do you know a good actor? When they, how do you know a good actor straight away? Because you can get a lot of raw talent, I'd imagine, um, going I like, through acting you know school. I like, I like John, um, Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah. I like Jake Gyllenhaal because he transforms he's into his roles. Nightcrawler to when he played that uh, the film where he played the boxer. He transforms. He completely, he immerses himself. And I, I don't see the actor. I see, I see the character. That's what, to me, makes a phenomenal actor. What about method acting? Yeah. Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah. You see a lot of these actors are fucked up as well to live that part. Jim Carrey, I think he played The Man in the Moon. But he mm -hmm. was nearly sacked off the fucking set, he nearly kicked off because he was just being a pest. But he actually was being the guy, Andy Hoffman, I think it was. And oh, was Hoffman, amazing, yeah, 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 yeah. Amazing yeah. documentary about it. But he was actually so close to getting kicked off set. He was with Lawrence and Olivier, and, Lawrence, mm -hmm. and he was like method, and he stayed up all night, and he's like, oh, I don't know how to do this scene. I've been up all night, and I'm trying to do this. And Lawrence Olivier just said, just act, dear boy. Just act. <laughs> Because just, Brando just don't think learned these lines. He used to just to go off. Brando, oh, hands down, is the most, the greatest actor ever fucking lived. How so? He had something that no one else had and and no one else I don't think will ever have. He had this charisma, this aura, this, he, this sense. I, I, he, I don't know what it is. I can't, it's really hard to even say. I mean, he broke, he broke... He broke the um, 
the cycle, not the cycle, but he broke back then when everyone was acting, everything was very over the top. Every everything was very dramatic. And then he came along and was just natural, cool, chilled. No one ever seen that before. When he did Street Car Name Desire, Vivian Lee, he was great. I love Gone with the Wind. She was all very over the top. And he was like, Hey, how are you doing? Everyone was like, Whoa, who's this guy? Effortless. Effortless truthfulness acting he brought to the table. And he had a tough life. I think he had alcoholic parents and he had he had it very tough. Um, even for, in fact, when he was older, you know, quite I think a couple, a couple of his kids died as well. He had a tough, tough life. Yeah, sad. And he suffered quite a lot. And he, But he he had a lot of empathy as well. You tend to zero a lot of the men at the top. So if I watched the Elvis film, I don't agree with Elvis's wife being meeting her at 14 as well. For me, it's a fucking sex case. It doesn't, I think people get famous and they kind of block out that. But if she's 14... You're a fucking sex case. You're, what was it, 26, yeah, 27? Yeah, That's yeah, not yeah. normal. No, it's no not. matter how big he is. No. But the the, the thing, I, it kind of, not feel sad, but he was the most famous man in the world and he was so paranoid of being forgotten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. Yeah. That that method of thinking, the, the just pressure of being forgotten, but yeah, he's the most, and he never left America. I think he was in Scotland. I think he landed in Presswick came from Germany when he was in the army. I think the only place he ever stepped foot on was Scotland other than America. Really? Yeah. He stopped off at Presswick apparently. That's, oh, it's the only place he place went outside to. America. Well, I think he was in Germany but other than that because I think his manager was a bad gambler so he used mm, to keep yeah. in the casinos and he used to get free tabs so mm. he was staying in America because he wanted to travel out to, like he was getting a million pound to do a gig in Tokyo or China or wherever it was. So he had bad people around him. Yeah. Do you see that everywhere in this industry, especially? Yeah. Bad people, leeches. I mean, like Pacino, he's he's a uh, one of his, I think it was his uh, accountant or his business manager, stole everything from him. He's, he's wiped his accounts. I mean, these people, they just, they, uh, that's what that's what people do. It's, it's so, it's such a, you know, like someone that, what, what they did to me, they, they, they exploited me, this, this woman, and she sold my story. It's just like, oh, what can I take from you? Oh, great. They just suck the life out of you and and just take whatever they can. Where does the trust, how do you learn to trust then? I don't know. Guarded? Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's safer than getting screwed over. Can feel all the shit that you went through. Yeah. But also you gotta you got to learn to trust people as well. It's fucking hard. Yeah. I'm trying, trying to do that. Trying to learn to do that. It's tough. Especially in this day and age. See when you then, so you get a script. You need to get funding for it. And yep. then how much is the preparation? See when you've got to find destinations and that. Who does all that? Is that the director, the producer, producer? producer. So, so he finds destinations for a certain scene. Yeah. Oh no! Well, for the for the usually you shoot the whole film in the in a country. Mm-hmm. So you shoot in a. a uh, you shoot your film where there's a good tax credit so we just shot in Malta where there's a 40% tax credit which is insane I've shot before in Budapest um, with a good tax credit or you know so or what's a tax cheap. credit whatever you spend they the government gives it back to you for because you're bringing job opportunities for them You're yeah it's really good so if you've done a 10 million film you get 4 million back mm-hmm. what's America prices different in every state uh, a lot of people shoot in Georgia Louisiana, um, East Coast, LA doesn't have a tax credit. Puerto Rico is very good. Um, yeah, Malta, Tenerife, London. Every, like, the UK has a tax credit, but not massive, and it's expensive. Do you think it's easier to make films now, especially with all the green screens getting used and not as much? Yes, I help. think it's very oversaturated, though. It's, there's a lot of movies out there and a lot of bad movies out there. It's just, it's, it's, it's tough. It's fucking tough. What's the greatest film you've ever seen? Oof. It, my my favourite film changes. I go through phases. Good mood. Yeah, I like, there's like, as you said, I, there's like a top, like five, ten films that I like to watch and rewatch. I love, I love, Scarface I love Boys Don't Cry I love Alien I love The Shining The Fog um, they're pretty dark movies actually all those films aren't they no comedies <laughs> fuck's sake One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest I love Jack Nicholson's my best actor 
Brilliant. So it's unbelievable. He's unbelievable. Brilliant. He seems that seems natural to him. Free flowing. It doesn't seem like acting. He just seems to do it just mm-hmm. with ease. Just a mad bastard. One flavor of cookers nice just seemed like that made so many people in that movie. I think if you can if you can play a role that that's close to you, that's good because you're, you're you're acting less. That's why I'm really excited about Duchess coming out as well, and I'm I just feel like. I'm just fucking excited about that role. South East London girl meets a very powerful man, head of a cartel. He gets portrayed. She takes over. She becomes his, the boss. It's fucking it's pretty badass. You mean part? Yeah, of course. I'm Duchess. It's all right, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it does well for you then. Yeah. So how do you feel? Because you're what age? You know, 31, 32? Uh, I, I just turned 31. So he's still fucking young. Do you know what I mean? So, what do you think? And looking back at all, were you glad you went through the journey you went through, but to make you who you are today, or is there a lot of regret? I think I think if I didn't do certain things or go through the things I went through, I wouldn't be where I am today. So, it, it almost feels like everything's a give and take. Everything's a, everything's a sacrifice. Like not a sacrifice, but everything. Nothing comes for free. Whatever you give. Or whatever you get, you're always giving something up. Yeah. Right? So it's like, okay, so I'm doing all these things. I've, I've got all this shit going on, but I've had to give up quite a lot as well. And whenever I'm giving, I'm, I'm, I'm giving, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I think there's always a price to pay. What about for any young actors and actresses wanting to go f- become successful, famous, or whatever they're chasing? What advice would you have for them? How do they look out for the shit that you've been through as well? What's the telltale signs? Don't trust anyone. That's for sure. Like, j- but just standard stuff. Like, <sighs> you have to know. Yeah, you, ha- you have to. It's really hard though because a lot of these people are good, good manipulators, and they're good snakes. They're good. Uh... First of all, if you want to do acting, if you want to be an actor, fucking just do it. Go for it. Don't. Don't think about it or like make your own shit like i i literally and, I, and i'm still doing it today kicking down that fucking door wherever it takes okay i i, I want to make this movie i want to do this yeah but the budget or this or we can't get that okay okay this actor doesn't want to do it we'll get someone else we don't want that director fuck him we'll get someone else like we're, i don't take you don't take no for an answer like okay i want to i want to do this i want to do this kind of movie oh, but this person doesn't want you in okay i'll do it myself like like just do it I, I just find a way to find a fucking way to do it. So many great actors out there and the actors that I've worked with and it's tough and yes, it's easier said than done to do it, but that's what I do. I just, I just make it happen. You know, I've, I've done, I've got two movies coming out this year that I've, I've funded, produced, starred in. That's, that's big. And I'm, and I'm like, I need to do another one this year. I need, like, I've just got back from Malta and I need to do another one. Like you just got to have that, that drive. You got to have that. You got to just, and not have a plan B. Like, I don't know what, what else I would do. Like, that's it. You can't, you can't, you just all in. And sacrifice. You have to make fucking sacrifices. So many people, oh yeah, but I don't want to move here because I've got a family. Well, then you're not going to do it. You just got to put it first. Your career, number one, and do it and go for it. You can't, you can't have, you can't, as I said, sacrifice. You can't have it all. Yeah, but I want to do this and I'll keep my job here and I'll do that. No. You gotta go. You gotta go in a hundred percent. It's not gonna work. Who would you like to work with? Oh God, I'd love to work with James Cameron, Ridley Scott. Um, oh, there's so many great directors uh, and, and producers actually. Um, great and uh, so many great actors. I'd love to work with. Um, I'd love to work with Jake Gyllenhaal. I think he's phenomenal. Um, Susan Sarandon, Charlie Theron. Meryl Street. I mean, the list goes on. She was brilliant in Monster. <sighs> Serial killer. Yeah. Fucking unbelievable. I think she won an Oscar for that. Yeah. Amazing. It's uh, funny a phenomenal you, yeah. director. Kim, um, Kimberly Pierce, I think it was. Or, no, no, no. Someone else. But Kimberly Pierce did Boys Don't Cry. Brilliant movie as well. Uh, Hilary Swank. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that when she was a girl wanted by a boy? Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, girl yeah, wanted by a boy. She, One yeah, of my favourite movies. Dark as fuck, that film. Oh, I love I loved it. Yeah. I love their, their relationship. She's a great actress, Hilary Swank. Is that Million Dollar Baby? Million Dollar Baby. She yeah. was unbelievable in that. Yeah. So, going forward for future plans? 
future plans is to God, what's first? Being happy, and making movies. I'm like, my happy, making movies. Mental health, right? Number one, sort my yeah. sort sort that out because I'm I'm kind of at that stage now where I was like, oh, fucking hell, Charlotte, slow down. Like, okay, I've just done this. Now I need to do this. And now I'm like, oh, it's like slow down. I've done this. I want to enjoy a little bit as well. I want to travel a little bit more. Now I'm back in Europe and I'm not in LA in the middle of fucking nowhere. I want to travel a little bit more when I'm not making films. I want to enjoy, uh, enjoy my success and carry on working very hard. It's really hard for me to like not to, 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 to relax and not work, but I know I need to as well. I need to, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to continue making movies, um, being able to speak and tell my truth and tell everything, put certain people to justice, which I'm doing each day, and um, enjoy the next chapter of my life. How can you, when can you then shed light on everything? Can you ever do that in the future where you just fucking go all guns blazing or is that a case of, okay, it's done now, it's time to move forward? It all depends what the outcome is. By the end of this year, I'll know. And are, is it court cases? Yeah. By the end of this year, I'll know where, where I stand and um, what the necessary next steps are. Mm-hmm. How do you feel just going over your story today? Oof. <laughs> Good, I think. Yeah, it's just a journey. Listen, proud of you. Just for keep going and <sighs> yeah, just try to get things. Because it's, listen, I know what, how dark it can go in life and it's I know your story is pretty deep which we'll touch on hopefully one day Absolutely. but people need to understand the shit that you've been through the shit that you've overcome the shit that you're doing now so people can take inspiration from that and yeah. just all you can do in life no matter how dark it is or how much trauma we've got on the bottom line is you just need to kind of try and push through it to get fucking either around it or over it or something because there's no point in staying in a life of pain and misery it's, life is too hard just fucking try to go on with it when life's going good. Never mind if you've got all this darkness over you. It's just to try and face it, handle it, and try and sh- flip the chapter. But it's difficult because the mind can play tricks sometimes when you're happy. You shouldn't be happy. You're sad. But when you're sad, you try and be happy. You try and force it. So it is mad life, but it's just the fucking way it is. Where can people get in contact with you, Charlotte, social medias and Maybe um, ask you questions. People who's been through the same shit that you've yeah. went are, are inspiring young actors and actresses to get in contact. How do they get in contact? Um, so I am on Instagram, Charlotte Kirk Official. I am on Facebook and um, I have a website as well. Um, so I'm like up to date and you can email me on there and my latest projects and all that kind of good stuff. You leave all the links in the descriptions. Shaza, would you like <laughs> to finish up on anything? Um, if I had a quote, what? Well, let me ask you. If you yeah. had a quote, what would it be? <laughs> mm, that's a good one. Mm. Yeah, never like the never let the pain of the past kind of darken your bright future. I guess just there's always better days out there. There's always light at the end of the tunnel was cheesy as that shit as there is I've spoke to enough people who's been through mass amounts of trauma and pain but they've overcome it they've became better people they've learnt from it they then help others and then do something more constructive with their life because people can be all doom and gloom just repeating the same dark shit people don't want to hear it all the time so it's like mm-hmm. a, move on yeah just move on. listen make the fucking changes to to create an amazing future no matter how what age you are how dark your past is you can make a good life that's not a quote that was a full fucking film yeah there, that was quite a lot that's but, a paragraph yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> what about yourself um i'm gonna have to quote from the great frank sinatra i did it my way oh blue eyes <laughs> but he only got the parts because he was a fucking and with the mafia that bastard <laughs> exactly old fucking nutcase him maybe because he's a guy it's a different time as well very different different time yeah, because you look at who was the girl with the blonde hair? The presidents, he was, the the, presidents and we're all with. Not that he was married to, not. No, it was a girl they were all fucking about with, the young girl, the actress. Marilyn Monroe. Oh, Marilyn Monroe, of course. But you see the how much she was <laughs> targeted, the man. She seemed as if she was passed around. and. Oh, yeah. And then it says it was a suicide with her, but then that goes a lot deeper now. Yeah. People say, people say she was pregnant with someone's baby. Yeah. 
Yeah. So again, that's how dark it is. You you have enough power where you can speak out, then you you do become a threat. Yep. Do you know what I mean? So, listen, Charlotte, for coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly you. enjoyed that. Proud of you for everything you're doing. We'll get you back on when we're fully ready to fucking expose the lot of them. Absolutely. Name, addresses, <sighs> I'll fucking expose every single one of them, not yes, a problem. Please. <laughs> but thanks for coming on today again. Would you like to finish up on anything? No, no, this is great. Thank you so much. Proud of you. Keep going. Thank you.